Let's talk a little bit about what I call six rules. Uh, okay, these are six, six leadership rules. The reason I use this is because um, when you tell people what to do, or tell an organization kind of, we're going in this direction. I'm reminded of a, a, an old sailing issue that ship's captains in the old sailing days, they would leave Liverpool or leave New York and they'd be gone for three months. And their job was to get to Liverpool to get to New York in three and a half months. If you tell an organization we're going in this direction and given the proper guidance, implicitly what you're saying is I'm giving you the authority to deviate as long as you do what I've asked you to do in terms of getting there. If you tell somebody I'm giving you an azimuth, I want you to steer 270, that's very specific. So that's fine if you've got a power boat you can set a GPS on 270 and keep going until you run out of gas. If you're running a sailing ship, you get winds, waves, and a whole bunch of other things. So as a result, you're constantly tacking across the ocean to get from A to B. So it's important from a personality basis that how you define direction for your organization is a function of your personality. Are you a control freak that you're constantly giving people azimuth corrections, or do you tell people, we're going in this direction, I want you to get to Liverpool in three and a half months. How you get there, I don't care. So the second part of this is listen. Now, that's easy. Everybody knows how to listen, right? Wrong. You watch people in a room, and this is especially true in today's world, that you go to a meeting or you go to some kind of activity and half the people in the room are on their, on their Blackberries or cell phones or whatever it is, Googling or whatever have you. Are they listening? No. Or what happens is you have a meeting, you're the boss, and you're sitting at your desk, and your fingers are drumming on the desk. What nonverbal communications are you telling your people that you don't care? What they're saying is not important. The meeting is perfunctory. Listening is a two-way street. Listening requires active participation and the person who is doing the talking to be clear, concise, and to the point. It requires active listening, so if you don't understand something, you ask the question. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay, trust and empower. Uh, easy to say, what are the rules of trust? I have a slide that I, I built as a result of this conversation. Of What do you mean by trust? In my previous world, trust was relatively simple. You sent a patrol out, and if they got into trouble, you bailed them out. And if somebody got wounded, they knew someone was going to come and get them. If you are a young 19-year-old rifleman, you're in a foxhole by yourself in the middle of the night, you knew that someone was going to come out and check on you. So as a result, organizations build trust based on stressful environments. Organizations build trust based on shared goals, shared accomplishments. When you live in an IT type world today, it is very difficult to build trust because emails are not communications from a leadership perspective. When no one's looking, do the right thing. That's a very simple rule that it gets to the who you are as a person. It's very easy to look good when the boss is around. But at 10 o'clock at night, when you've got a crew that's working on a project, you ought to stop by and say hello to them. When something's going wrong, you ought to be there and just say, we got a problem. Not you got a problem, or I got a problem, we got a problem. And it doesn't make it, and you don't have to tell your boss this. If your workers don't think that you're part of their team, you've lost the fight. If you're in charge, take charge. It gets to the issue of whether you're a manager or a leader. If you really are in charge, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference who comes to your site, that's your site. If you're running an organization, that's your site. You know more about that, what organization that organization is doing than any visitor in the face of the earth 
and you have the courage to stand up and say, I'm doing it this way because. Now, if they want to fire you, that's fine. I've been fired by a lot of different people, to include the President of the United States. <laughs> but he was wrong, and he, he didn't apologize. But he, <laughs> but he recognized he was screwed up. <clears throat> Balance your personal and professional life. This is hard. This is a cultural issue. If you're in the UK, this is a little bit easier to do. If you're in America, you're a disguised type, type A personality that consumed, gets consumed by emails even on vacation. So how do you do it? I don't have the answer. I've, been, I've never figured it out. But I will tell you that every person that I know that's successful goes through a period where their career is more important than their family life. You don't get to be successful. You don't get to be a successful CEO by coming in at 8 and going home at 5. It just doesn't work. This is the old IBM culture that started in America, that everybody had to wear the same suit and all that kind of stuff. So, but my point is, is that you have to figure out how you carve out time. And this time that I'm talking about isn't just going to the kid's soccer game. This is how do you cut, carve out time for yourself so that you can think. Thinking is incredibly important. As I said at the beginning, if you stand still, you're dead. You constantly have to be testing the environment you're operating in. Is it changing? Do I have to change? What do I have to change? Is the person that I just promoted into this position the right person for this job? Because everybody has a Peter Principle ceiling. I don't care who you are. 